sins. Amen. The most valuable thing on earth is souls, but the only thing that could pay for a soul is his blood. That makes his blood the most valuable thing. Amen. Amen. If you want to find his blood, we were practicing tonight and I thought about this. If you want to find the blood of Jesus, I tell you where his blood is. It's in his body. Amen. The church. Amen. I'm, I'm so thankful for the church because that's where his blood is. Amen. It's flowing through his body tonight. Amen. And we get to be partakers of it. God bless you. You may be seated. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If I was going to war, or if I was facing a storm named Matthew, I would want to be covered with the blood. Amen. 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 The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Amen. He's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen. We've got, we do have a covering over us. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that. We don't need to fear. The, fear. Amen. God bless you. We're going to ask our ushers to come tonight. And, and um, they're going to come. And we're going to bring our offering. Amen. And so as they're coming, we just want to welcome any guests tonight. Don't know if, 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 you're, if you're a guest tonight, we want to. Just honor you. Thank you for being with us. If you'd just lift your hand or stand any guests tonight. No, we're glad you all are here. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Brother Peter, it's good to see you tonight. Amen. God bless you. It's good to see everybody. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. We just thank you for loving us. We ask you to bless the service. Bless the word as it goes forth. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight as you give. tonight. Amen. And after you do that, let's shake hands and, be, and greet one another. But let's bring our tithing and offering to the, to the uh, ushers. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming tonight. It's a wonderful thing to be able to deal with faithful people. And uh, it was mind-boggling to me the dynamic service we had Sunday morning and Sunday night. And uh, I wish it would have affected more people, but it didn't. But everybody that is anybody is here. So I'm thankful for that. And uh, I want to to uh, read in your hearing tonight. I want to do a little something. Well, I wouldn't say different. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Uh, the last two services that I had the privilege to speak to you, uh, one was on Sunday morning about... Uh, taking a risk and what faith is and you spell faith R-I-S-K and then I had a bunch of leftovers last Wednesday night and kind of gave you some more leftovers about risk and what faith is okay I hope you understand by now my perception my understanding is literally faith is taking a risk that's what it is when you step out when you respond you react to it but I want to I want to add something to that now. Okay, I'm I'm going to be talking tonight on understanding faith. Okay, understanding faith. Okay, I'm reading Hebrews 11:1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, and I want to go to. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Lord, bless the teaching in Jesus' name. Bless these sweet people. You may be seated. Praise God. Understanding faith. I found something very, very uh, powerful in my way of seeing things. From the Gospel of John, you don't have to turn there. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to misquote it. But you can. You want to write it down. John 16, in verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. And if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And Now watch this. And when he is come... He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Three things that the Holy Ghost is supposed to do. Three things. Okay, he's supposed to reprove of sin and, uh, and of righteousness and judgment. But, but, but in all my life, I have never heard anybody preach on this. I'm sure they have, and they've done a wonderful job. And in all the hundreds of books that I've studied, articles I've read, I never can I can never remember one time ever reading this topic covered. Now watch what it says, because we Pentecostals we label a lot of things as sin, and if we don't label them as sin, we label them as no nos. And a good thing to stay away from and not to practice that, not to do that, okay? But I want to show you something that's very revelatory to me. In, in uh, verse 9 where he says, of sin, and here it is. Here's what sin is because they don't believe on me. That's it. Nothing else. Don't need nothing else. That's it. So the essence of sin is to refuse, reject, mock, make fun of, damn and condemn what Jesus has had to say. He says, this is sin. They don't believe on me. What I've said and what I've done for them. That's sin. You can put everything in one box. That is sin. Okay, so, so with that, we need to understand what faith is. Okay, now last couple of weeks I've told you faith is spelled R-I-S-K. It's taking a risk. I want to add to that part two. Here's what faith is. Here's what faith is. Believing what God has said. And if you don't believe and I don't believe what God has said, 
then Jesus said, that's sin. Not smoking, not drinking, not honky-tonking, not being immoral, not doing stupid stuff. Those are all episodes and what have characteristics, but sin is you don't believe what I've said and you don't believe what I've done for you. That's why people are not born again. They don't believe what I've said. The reason why people don't try to live godly, faithful, and holy is because they don't believe what I said. The reason people live sloppy, loose lives is because they don't believe what I said. And this is sin. They don't believe on me, on what I've said and what I've done. And so that's what all sin is comprised of. But, but, but tonight, I, so I hope I don't lose you. When it says, you know, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is, is, is the very ground on which our beliefs are attached to. It is the foundation. It is the substance. It is, if you can accept this, it is the title deed for the things that you were promised. You've got the title deed. See, the only reason Israel got disinherited from the promised land for 40 years is they didn't believe what God said. Joshua and Caleb believed what he said. And they went in, and the rest of them stayed out. And when God had given them a title deed, behold, I've given you the promised land. Here's your title deed. It's yours. And they looked at it and said, ah, what a bunch of junk that is. I don't believe that. And so then God just put them on a U-turn and said, okay, take 40 years and go this way. All because they didn't believe what he said. When you go to the book of Numbers, chapter 14, and, and they want to stone Moses and they want to stone Aaron because they're trying to get the people to believe what God said and that they can take the promised land, the Lord seems to put out a lamentable sigh and cry. And he says, how long will it be ere, ere, E-R-E, ere they believe in me? These ten times I have shown them all these miracles, they still think I'm a liar. You see, when we don't believe what God has promised us, we live in doubt. We live in fear. We live in unbelief. We, we live, now watch this, we live in a hope that has no basis. We have people sometimes are saying, well, I'm hoping. Well, what's the basis of your hope? Oh, I'm stupid. I'm just hoping. No, you've got to have a basis for your hope. And faith is the basic foundation for your hope. God has promised. He cannot lie. Faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. So faith is attached to what you have heard God has said. What you have heard God has done, and what you have heard he's going to do. Whether it came to you directly or through somebody else. Because when the Lord cast that legion of demons out of the Gadarene in Mark 5, the Bible said, he went all over Gadara, he amazed the whole countryside with his testimony, telling them what Jesus had done for him. Okay? Some believed him, some didn't believe him. Why? Because some it's faith and some it's unbelief. When, when he did that wonderful mercy for the lady in the John 4, the woman in Samaria, the much married woman that he met at the well, and told her, says, yeah, you don't, you don't have a husband, uh, you've had five, and the fellow you live with is not your husband. She goes back in and says, come meet a man that told me everything ever I've done. Is not this the Christ? So she, her faith was based upon what she had heard from Jesus. Right now I'm going, I'm going slow because I don't mean to be insulting, but Pentecostal people are not good thinkers. I didn't say you don't think. I said we're not good thinkers. We're good praisers. But good thinkers. Thinkers. Because we need to, we need to break through this somehow to... To, to understand something because uh, faith 
has to be the groundwork for what we believe. It has to be. Now, now listen carefully. If there is no real God for our beliefs and hopes, then you don't have faith. Because your faith gets its authenticity from its object. You can believe in the wrong thing and be lost forever. And be as sincere and dedicated and sacrificial, submitted and committed as you can be and be damned forever. That is the terrible part of false doctrine. False doctrine, watch, has no basis in which to give you faith because it doesn't have the right object. I know what night it is. Come on. Put the cap on. Think. 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 Let me ask, let me try it again. What is the basis of your faith? What is it? What is it? You were raised in Pentecost? What is it? You got goosebumps running down your nose? What 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 is what is what is the basis for your faith? The only groundwork that you can have for basis for your faith is the Word of God and the work of God. So, so in essence, one, faith is risk, yes. Two, faith is literally believing what God has said. And, and the reason why we have a battle at that time, it's called the trial of your faith. Because when you get to exercise your confidence and persuasion and response to what you've heard, you run into obstacles. You run into barriers. You run into your own self-doubts. You run into your own fears. You run into, well, we've never seen it this way before. It never was done this way before. But we got to get a hold of an understanding of what faith really is. Faith is not a feeling. Well, mercy, 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 mercy. Uh, let me try it again. The only foundation that we can have for faith is the Word of God. That's it. According to Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Okay? Faith cometh. Faith cometh. Now, here's the problem. We're responsible to mixeth. M-I-X-E-T-H. Mixeth. If you, you can find that in Hebrews 3, when you get to the last verse of Hebrews 3, the first two verses of Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. They didn't enter the promised land, for they did not mix their faith with the word of faith. So God gave them a promise, the word of faith, and they wouldn't mix their faith with what they heard, and they would disinherit it. I'm, I'm concerned that we are not experiencing things God wants us to have, not because he doesn't love us and we don't love God and, and we don't, quote, have faith, but to what dimension do we have faith? Are we totally persuaded, convinced, absolutely sold out to what he said? Is going to happen because when you have that kind of persuasion you're, you're pregnant with expectation the only reason the leper in Matthew 8 ran up to Jesus 8 1 2 and 3 and said if you will I know you can is because he had heard what Jesus had already been doing faith comes by hearing when Bartimaeus was being passed by the crowd, he couldn't see anything, but he heard. And he said, what's the noise? He said, oh, Jesus Nazareth, the miracle worker. Oh, the miracle worker's here. Hey, Jesus. He, his faith was activated by what he had heard about Jesus. All these different people that came to Jesus in his ministry had heard something. The Syrophoenician woman traveled all those miles to get the demon cast out of her daughter. Why? She heard Jesus was merciful, kind, gracious, powerful, good. 
And so she appealed to the man of what she had heard these things. And when we appeal to him on that premise, we honor him. He gets magnified over that. When the nobleman came all the way out of there and came back to get his boy healed that was dying back home, he had heard that Jesus had healed sick people and delivered people and, and had mercy on people. And so what he had heard about Jesus made him believe. And so his faith was activated. Your faith has got to be tied to, do you believe in God? Wait a minute. That, that, that's, that's the generic thing. That's for all the stupid people in this world that say, I believe in Jesus. That don't help you one bit. That, that don't help, listen to me. That don't help you one bit. I believe in Jesus. That don't mean beans. Are you going to act on it? In other words, there's millions of people believe in God and they disobey, they disobey him every day. They tell them to drop dead every day. Don't bother me. Don't, don't try to govern me. Don't try to rule my life. I believe in you, but shut your mouth. See, a generic, I believe in God. That, that, how many times have you heard me say that? You say you believe in God. You're only one step ahead of a fool. Because a fool has said in his heart there is no God. So the fool said there's no God. The guy next to a fool says, I believe in God. But you're both on the same diving board. This is a crucial, crucial issue for us because only real faith pleases God. And there is a counterfeit faith. Let me try it again. And the Holy Ghost will reprove people of sin for they believe not on me. That's what sin is. We don't believe on what he's done and we don't believe what he said. And the Lord said, that's sin. You can label anything else you want. That's sin. I'm a true God. I'm a faithful God. I'm the only true living God. I'm on your side. And you tell me I'm a jerk and I'm not worth your time. That's sin. You don't believe what I've told you. That's why Israel didn't get into the promised land. Because they would not mix their faith with the word of faith that was told them. Now, I'm, I'm not confusing you, am I? Okay, I, I, I'm going slow because you, you, you got that Wednesday night look. <laughs> Everything regarding faith depends on what God has spoken and has what he has spoken true. And does he have the power to fulfill what he has spoken? That's all about faith. Now, I'm sure there's people here who say, well, if Jesus stood up tonight and told me something, I'd believe it. I don't think so. I don't think so. I told him before, I said, if Jesus Christ were to preach here Sunday, the same 300 people wouldn't be here tonight because they don't believe what he said. See, if you really believe, that's what he says, if you call me Lord, why don't you do what I say? Well, because we don't believe you're Lord. We just call you Lord. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Oh, because the church I go to and the preacher I said, it don't matter a flip. You can live like a whoremonger, a drunk, a lie, a cheat. It don't matter. You believe me, Jesus. That's all you got to do. He says, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? In other words, if we call him Lord... He's expecting us to commit, to believe, to surrender. And he says, why do you call me Lord, but then you go do everything your way? That's why, that's why we have thousands of denominations. It's not because we're smarter than anybody. God just showed us mercy. But the thousands of denominations come from the fact that people have made up their mind that God doesn't require anything but to believe. I believe. What, what about behave? No, you go to the Pentecostal church with that behave stuff. I believe. Well, if you folks got married to some wife, 
you believe she is your wife and you need to behave. See, that believing should birth behaving. Uh, I know it's a little slim pickings now, but an amen wouldn't hurt me at all. <laughs> you understand? Oh, God, there's the, there's the walking Bible way. I'm, watch. The Bible said that God spoke to Abraham. Now, you want to you write it down, Romans 4, 17 through 21. That's the beautiful episode that that's talking about. And, and the beautiful part of 21 is said, he was persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. I've taught you that for 30 years, the three Ps, persuaded. He had the power to perform it. He was able to do it. So, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. I would like to just throw in something that has nothing to do with my Bible study. I just want to throw it in in case I never see you ever again. We love to talk about Abraham going to Mount Moriah and that tremendous sacrifice. Let me tell you something. Here we go. This is a little rock your little world. God said of Abraham, Abraham, my friend. The prophet said of Abraham, who was the friend of God. Now watch. Here we go. Friendship with God does not come easy. Believing in God is easy. Doing what he tells you ain't easy. So that that wonderful sacrifice in 22 of Genesis on Mount Moriah, that altar episode was the culmination of many previous altar experiences. You, got, you hear me? In other words, Abraham believed God when he didn't understand where he was going. God just told him to get out of the earth, the Chaldees, go to a land I'll show you. He didn't know where he was going, Hebrews 11, but he knew who told him. And he acted. Because here's how you can tell when you believe. You act. For you and I to say we believe and we don't act, we're lying to ourselves. That's silly. That's crazy. How can you say you believe and you don't respond? You got me? Now watch. Every time Abraham built an altar, there was a couple of things that, well, I feel like talking. There was a couple of things that took place. There was a, an action on Abraham's part towards God of thanksgiving and an act of fresh trust. And each altar he built helped to grow his faith and trust in God so that eventually, after a while, God said, that's my friend. And, 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 and can't nobody climb Moriah without previous altar experiences. Can't nobody. No. It ain't never going to happen. That's why it took God almost 25 years of altars, experiences, episodes. Wait a minute. Watch this. Lying, dishonesty. Deceit, forgiveness, renewal, starting over. See, every time Abraham had an episode, it was a fresh chance for his faith to get strong by acting on what God told him. Now, in the middle of all that, when he's building these altars and he's, he's developing his friendship with God, the other side shows up. The side that doesn't trust God. The side that is not sure of what God told him. That's why he goes in, in 13, he goes into Egypt and lies about Sarah. See, all of God's great people are usually liars somewhere. They may not lie openly, they just, they just got some aspects of their life that ain't too honest. Okay, ready? Look somewhere. So I wonder who he's talking to. In 
the easiest, the easiest one to lie to is always ourselves. I know when I get ready for a fast day or a longer fast, it is so easy to lie to myself and I'll say, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, well, I fasted three days two weeks ago. Uh, God knows that my stomach hurts. I wish I could get a witness of somebody around here right now. <laughs> How many times do we get ready to, to give ourselves to a fresh committal to prayer, and we almost make it to prayer, but a yawn takes us out. And you lay on your back and you say, Lord, you know. I don't know how many times over my little walk with the Lord I have tried and tried and tried and tried to do what they always say, that get up early in the morning and just have a great prayer season. That, I'm going to let that simmer for a minute here. <laughs> Abraham went through, went through ups and downs and ins and outs to become the friend of God. And God did not write him off when he made some bad choices and he made some poor mistakes. God didn't write him off. God showed extra grace and extra mercy because God knows both sides of us. He knows when we really want to and he knows when we don't want to. And he knows when we want to do better and for some reason we're weak and we just, we just seem like we flop. But you just get what I'm saying. Abraham's friendship with God was not a piece of cake. You start reading that from... Genesis 11 to Genesis 24, 25, and that's, that's quite a story. And, and fighting the kings, and, and the king of Sodom wants to help him, and Melchizedek wants to bless him, and, and, and then his wife convinces him to do the wrong thing with Hagar, and he makes that mistake. And You know, remember when that guy was preaching Sunday, and I jumped up and said something, you probably missed what I said, when he said, well, you know, after Abraham listened to, to his wife about Hagar, I, I yelled right out here because I've never heard a Pentecostal preacher ever say it one time. I'm sure they've said it, but I wasn't there when they said it. That little stupidity that he did with his wife in having his episode with Hagar cost God to go silent for 13 years. You want to have an easy way to shut the voice of God off in your life just don't do what he says. And that's when it gets scary, because now God doesn't talk to us. We just go through the motions. Here's my money. Hallelujah. Here is my body. Right. But if we don't have God talking to us, we're going to have some trouble. It was 13 years after that episode with Hagar before God ever spoke to Abraham again. I want you to ask yourself something. How long has it been since he's talked to me? Whether from the pulpit, whether your own prayer life, your own conscience, the word of God. I don't know of anything greater in your life or my life than for us to be able to sense and feel and hear the voice of God talking to us. Whether in blessing or whether in chastisement or correction. I'd, I'd rather have God deal with me in correction than to leave me alone. I'd rather have God give me a good spiritual spanking than, than to just turn around and let me go off somewhere, be damned and lost forever. I think that's really why David used to talk all the time and said, Be not silent unto me, O Lord, lest I be like them that go down into the pit. What was Saul's lamentable cry just before he lost everything in his life? The Lord answereth me not neither by dreams nor prophets, by Urim and Thummim. Urim and Thummim were the 12 stones that they wore. And when they 
appeal to God for an answer according to Bible history, one of the stones or the stones would glow one way or the other, would give them an indicator, yes or no. And we've got to be really careful that we don't turn around and some, somehow make faith to be, well, I didn't watch this, I didn't wear there, and I didn't go there, and I didn't do this. I did come to church, I paid my tithes, I gave my money, I didn't curse too bad this week. And no, we, we, faith is risk, and faith is simply believing God. And, and believing God is, is easy. It's easy when you don't need nothing done. You know, just generic. I believe in God. Isn't that great? That's like saying, I believe the road was made to drive on until you have a red light. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to obey the law. Well, anytime, anytime we want to get into communion and to intimacy with God, God is going to make sure we have tests and trials and chances to mess up and to grow and to blossom because faith is believing God even when you don't understand. That's, that's why God blessed Elijah so wonderfully. Every time God would tell him to do something, go to Cherith, go to Zarephath, go to Carmel. Do you realize when God told Abraham the promises that he gave him, all the guy had was what he heard. He had no fellow believers. He had no choir. He had no Jeff Arnold tapes to encourage him. I mean, he didn't have a good church like this to, to be a blessing to him. All he had was this invisible being that somehow this voice spoke to him, this impression came to him, and that's all he had. And yet God says, that's all you need. Because faith is believing God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Evidence. In other words, faith is your evidence that though you don't see it, you've been promised it. And, and why do you have faith? Because your faith is attached to the object. If the object is wrong, the outcome is going to be wrong. That's why doctrine is so important, that we believe the right doctrine. And I, I personally do not think that apostolic biblical doctrine is prison. I don't think it's bondage by a long shot. I think it's liberty and life. I, Let, let, let me just go real quick here, okay? Faith is believing God's word, and it becomes the foundation for what we hope for. So somebody's sick, they hope to be made well. That's fine. What is the basis of your hope? The word of God said he would heal me. There you go. That becomes the basis to give your faith its foundation. They lay hands on the sick, and the sick going to recover. That's how it works. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. The issue is not sincerity, but truth. So faith is hearing what God has said, and that what he has said is true, and that he who spoke is faithful who has promised. And so faith rests on what we have heard. It becomes the substance or the evidence of things not yet seen. In other words, we heard, we believe what we heard, and this is going to validate that, although it's not yet been manifested. That's how Mary ends up in that miracle of the angel said, the Holy Ghost shall overshadow you. And, and you'll conceive a holy thing, and, and it'll be the very Messiah, the Christ of God. And she says, let it be unto me according to thy word. That's why when she goes and visits in, the, I think, Luke 1, she visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who hath believed, for there shall be a performance of that which was promised to her. Now, now it takes a lot of faith to turn around and say, okay, I believe... I'm going to experience what don't make no sense. And it can't be proven, and it's never happened before. 
but it's going to happen because I believe God, because faith is believing God. That's why faith is believing God is attached to faith is risk, because you got nothing, and you can't get any encouragement from other people. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be kind here. I'm trying to be kind. How can I say this? There's a great problem that's happened in this world, and I feel like I've lived long enough to see that this crucial thing is now affecting the Pentecostal people. See, how can I say this? Our generation. Pentecost and non-Pentecost. We have not really lost our faith. We haven't. But we have misplaced it. This generation has politely told God to drop dead. And they have put their faith in science, medicine, education, government power, armies, Wall Street. That's where their faith is. And there's a scripture I was going to read to you, but I was going to quote it. It's in Second Chronicles. It's about 16. And, and Asa was attacked by a bunch of people, all these Ethiopians, and God gave him a miracle of deliverance. And, and they had a great time. And then he got attacked by another group of people. And instead of trusting God and calling on God, he went and made a covenant with a bunch of pagans. He said, here, break your, break your league with these people and be in league with us and save us. And so they did. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Asa. He had faith. He had been a recipient of active faith. But now the problem scared him, and now you can't trust God. So he goes to these pagans and says, make a covenant with me. And they make a covenant with him, and they fight. So it looks like he's won because he wins the fight. Oh, yeah, that was great. you got to watch out for these unnamed prophets who just come out of the closet, say a few things, and ruin your day, and step back. Because God's always got one of them floating around somewhere. And the minute he comes back from that victory of winning that war, this unnamed seer comes up to him and he said, Hey, weren't the Ethiopians and the Lubbans who were giant people, were they not a mighty host? And you relied on the Lord and the Lord delivered them into your hand? And Asa said, That's right. He said, Well, how come now these guys attacked you and you told God to drop dead? And you went and made a league with these pagans. You know what he did? He didn't lose his faith. He misplaced it. And God says, I don't think that's funny. Now you and your stupid little friends, you think that's funny. But I don't think. In fact, God says, you know what that is? That's insulting to me. I delivered you with this mighty host here. And now here come this new program, and now all of a sudden, you don't believe what I told you. That's what sin is. How many times in my life and your life have we had God in his mercy give us an answer, bring us through something, make a way where it was miraculous, and then we face something else, and we take care of it ourselves? Go ahead, look at your neighbor right now and say, I hate it when he talks like this to me. One writer said in Psalms 20, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, so we will remember the name of the Lord. Let the king hear us when we pray. See, all this stuff is a trial of our faith. When, when, when Hezekiah was invaded by this great army, and he didn't know what to do,
But he turned around and he prayed to God. He said, now I'm going to do what I can to fix the walls and do this and do that. But Lord, you've got to help us. We, we're not able to do this. We can't whip these people. We're not smart enough. Here's the danger where America and Russia and all these countries are. They are doing all their stupidity and God is not in the picture at all. He's not in the picture. He's praying in his name as outlawed in government facilities. You can't do all kinds of stuff. We have no... All you people that are watching your debates and listening to the two liars talking to you on the, on the internet and all that, which one is talking about let's seek God and fast and pray and let's humble ourselves before God and ask God to help us and turn our nation around? I'm telling you, we don't need a bigger army. We need a bigger prayer room. That's what we need. We need a nation that will fall down on its face and say, Lord, we've misplaced our faith. We need you to come to our rescue. I mean, I, I, I realize we as governments, we think we need battleships and rockets and atom bombs and all that stuff. Do you realize God, God owns an army that outdoes anything on this planet. God, God to, I don't mean to be irreverent towards the Lord when I say cool. I'll just, maybe I shouldn't say God's cool. God, God's fantastic. When he wants to, he can change languages. When he gets ready, he can talk bug talk. And 80 million flies invade the land. And then after they leave, then 463 billion locusts. Okay, you guys, go ahead. He can talk bug talk. If he needs to, he can talk creature talk. He goes, okay, that's enough. Uh, I'll take 475 million frogs. Come on up. Watch. In the, sto <coughs> in the story of Hezekiah. Now, I don't want to ruin your faith. But... The Bible says the angel of the Lord came down during that night and, and slew 185,000, okay? Now, now, now please, don't, don't give me no trash, okay? She's always looking, saying, I've got to catch him in a lie. I've got to catch him in a lie. I've got to make sure he's, not, he's telling the truth. She's not. Watch. When that angel come down, killed 185,000. That doesn't necessarily literally mean that the angel went whack, 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 whack. It could have very easily been God allowing an angel to release a bacteria. You don't think God can govern disease? With all these great armaments and stuff, God, when he gets ready, can take the biggest and mightiest ruler and army in the earth and just release a disease, release a fungus, release a bacteria, and it can humble the greatest army and bring it to the ground. Okay, I, I lost that one. Okay. When Jehoshaphat was attacked... He turned around and he said, you know what he did? He appealed to God's word and God's integrity. Because when he goes to pray, he said, Lord, and thou hast said that if we be invaded by a pagan army or wicked people, and they come to take the temple, they come to take the land, that if we would turn our face to you and offer prayer to you from this house, that you would defeat them. Now, Lord... We have no power against such an army as we're facing, but our eyes are upon you. And it was like God said, did you quote my word? Did you believe what I told you? That honors me. I'm going to help you. And the Bible said he released angels into that place, and they started causing confusion around them guys, and they killed each other. 
Now, I am convinced right now. I know there's atom bombs and there's H bombs and there's nuclear weapons and this one's got this stockpile and this one's got that stockpile. I just want you to take about 30 seconds and just in your mind, look at his stockpile. He owns all the critters. He owns all the bugs. You ready for this? He owns AIDS. He owns leprosy. He owns every bacteria. Everything belongs to him. He, he can just, just release something on. He can lay an army in the ground. In one night, 185,000 soldiers. Now, that's a quick working virus. Now, you say, well, the angels slew him. Well, you know, I think that's phraseology. That's terminology. I don't think that angel was going around saying, one for you, one for you, and one for you, one for you, one for you. I don't think the angel stabbed 185,000 people in that place. I think God just threw a blanket on him and said, virus, do your work. <laughs> now, see, you're looking at me like, no. <laughs> don't you get it? All the elements are under his auspices. He can do anything he wants to do. I'm, 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 I'm looking at this thing now. I know it's, it's funny, but it's not funny. Half the people are home buying water, okay? They're, they're waiting to protect themselves from the hurricane, okay? Matthew's coming up the state, going to wipe the whole place out, fine. And, and I, there's nothing wrong with us trying to batten down the hatches and, and get some water and batteries and stuff like that. But it's like God says, I could turn that any way I want to. I, I can blow that thing out to the Atlantic Ocean if I want to. <laughs> I remember one time I was preaching in Louisiana camp. You may not believe this, and, you know, that's your privilege. But I was there with the prophet, T.W. Barnes, and he was the, the dean of the camp, and I was preaching in Louisiana camp, and we had a massive... Uh, tornado storm and stuff coming in right into Tioga and, and it was coming right where we were and, and, and the, old, the old man, T.W. Barnes the prophet turned around and stood up in the service and just threw his hands up and commanded that thing to turn away and go back to the other direction and he went back and he said, it's okay it's done. Well, you know, people think spiritual people are stupid except in 30 minutes the tornadoes went out to the ocean and, and they never hit Tioga. You say, well, that's just weird. Really? I thought you were given power against the elements. I thought if you had faith in the Word of God, you can direct all kinds of stuff. You can turn enemies away. You can turn disease away. You can turn the elements away. And I know that... that okay. I'm, I'm going as slow as I can, okay? One of the problems that we're facing right now is that the church, the church and its faith has become man-centered rather than God-centered. That's why the Bible tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, that we have to make sure that, that our, I know it seems boring, at least it seems boring to me, to you. You got to get this. Faith is believing what God has said that it is true and being persuaded you act on it. For you and I to say we believe that God is true in what he said, but we don't act on it, we don't believe it's true. And our acting on it is what's called the trial of your faith. That's how Peter got on a boat. He heard what the Lord said. Come. See, when you get a, a, a word from the Lord, it don't make no sense. It violates all the laws of nature, and you can't make it happen. And you're probably half scared to death. But, but he walked, I know we say he walked on the water. Well, he really walked on the word is what he did. He walked on the word. The water was just there. Is anybody besides me in the house? I'm going to challenge you right now. 
that you've ever known for sure that God has given you a promise on something. And you acted on it. And sometimes it's come to pass and sometimes it's been slow coming. Remember, the Lord turned around and gave Abraham and Sarah an unbelievable promise that you're going to have a baby at 99 and 90. That was almost absurd, and yet all he had was the word of the king. But where the word of the king is, there's power, and who can say unto him, what doest thou? And so faith is believing what God has said. And for us to say we have faith, but it's not based on what God has said. We're on a fool's journey. We're, we're just religious. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I want to go just a little further. Jairus comes running to Jesus. He says, my little girl's dying. She's at the point of death. Come and lay your hand on her that she may be healed and live. And... Then we get the bad news. You know, it's too late. She's already dead. Trouble not the master. Jesus turns around and says, Only believe and she be made whole. Okay, now watch. He, he's got a promise from God in the face of impossibility. Believe and she shall be made whole. He didn't deny she was dead. He just said, Believe and she shall be made whole. You know what that did for him? Shut his mouth. Because what happens, usually when we get afraid, filled with panic, worry, consternation, we talk. And life and death is in the power of the tongue. You got to watch out what you say. And so he didn't say anything. Only believe. She shall be made whole. And he walks into that impossible situation. Now, now Jairus has got a promise. She's going to be whole. Jesus said she's going to be whole. I don't know how it's going to happen. Little girl, little damsel, little lamb, Tabitha Kumai, arrives. And she gets up and walks. And it's almost like Jesus said, I told you. Why are you surprised? I told you. And, and, all right, I'm going to ask you a question right now. It's, it's nice and dead as a hammer here Wednesday night. You couldn't possibly be upset. What's your faith based on? Please don't be dumb enough to say, I'm Pentecostal. That ain't going to help you none. I go to Arnie's joint. That ain't going to help you none. I, 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 I go to church Wednesday and Sunday. That ain't going to help you none. Unless your faith is based on believing what God has said, we have counterfeit faith. And you got to hear me. I know it's, maybe it sounds too simplistic for you brilliant theologians. But you've got to understand me. When you get a bunch of crisis and hell and horror and sadness and darkness and messes that seem to drive you crazy, you need to know what God has said to you so you can weather the storm. You've got to be able to walk in your dark cloud and realize you're coming out the other side of that dark cloud. Because he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'm not going any further than that right now. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That means that you've got victory if you believe that. And you can act on that irregardless of what you understand. Okay. God cannot lie. Real Bible faith is believing, watch, that God is and has perfect integrity and he can be trusted and he's totally, absolutely faithful. He cannot lie. He cannot change. And just because a promise has not been fulfilled as quickly as we thought doesn't mean it's been, it's been nullified or it's been destroyed, or it's been retracted. The Lord gave them this promise a long time ago. It took Abraham years and years and years of altar building. Can I say this? Yes, I will say it. I got the mic. I can say it. Yeah, I will say this. Watch. Every time you pray, every time you give, every time you come to church, 
Every time you go to the prayer room, every time you have your own prayer life in your house, you are building altars. You are offering God thanksgiving for his goodness, and you're developing a greater dimension of trust in God. Until you and I can get to that place like Abraham was like, I trust him. I, I, I trust him. I don't understand it, but I've been through so many episodes with him. I trust him. That's what Bible faith is, believing what God has said. Even Job said that. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Why? Well, because I've, I've proved them so many times before. And you sweet people that are here tonight, how many prayers has God answered for you? How many times has God come to your rescue? How many times has he made a way where there didn't seem to be a way? I mean, we got a, we got a record a mile long of all the things that God has done for us. Here, let me try it again. Friendship with God. I mean, intimate friendship with God didn't come easy for Abraham, and it don't come easy for us. Now, I know that may violate some of you sloppy, agape, happy, clappy, loony, wacky people. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Remember this. One writer said, a friend is born for adversity which also could mean that adversity is a good way to develop friendship. In other words, all right, Teresa, you say you believe in me? Fine. Here's a bunch of hell. Deal with it. Oh, and by the way, uh, I'm going to take you through. I'll see you on the other side, but here's a bunch of hell. Deal with it. Now, if, if you believe what God has said, sometimes you've got to believe what God has said when everything around you screams and says it ain't possible. It's wrong. It can't happen. It ain't going to be. And unfortunately, God forgive us, there's some people even in our own assembly that will agree with you. Yeah, that's right. It, it can't work. It won't happen. It's impossible. you, you, you got to get away from nincompoop people. And, and I, I hope that's not offensive to you, but, but nincompoop is a spiritual word that means stupid. People that try to talk you out of believing God. Why? But, well, it didn't work for me. Well, maybe you're stupid. It's going to work for me. I'm going to keep believing God. God has said something to me, and I'm going to build my faith on what he has said and not what I feel, nor what the doctor said, nor what the scientist said, nor what the government said, nor what the school system said. Am I making sense here? This is a really, man, this is like being in a refrigerator in Publix. Whew. You could hang meat in here, it's so cold. Whew. Okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, uh, maybe I'm, okay, go ahead and stand. I'm not helping you. I'm not helping you at all. Let's stand. Lord, bless everybody and give them a good night's rest and, and help them buy lots of water for the hurricane that they want. In Jesus' name, amen. Shake hands, be friendly, go with God. You're out early. Amen. It's okay. No problem. Sorry to bother you.